Coming up on this Thursday edition of Newsline at Noon, Korea Central Bank slashes its key rate to a historic low of 1.75 percent, citing the weak economic recovery, which is brewing concerns about a possible deflation. Global financial institutions are lowering their growth forecast for Korea this year, with some even predicting growth in the mere 2 percent range. Plus, senior diplomats from South Korea, China and Japan meet in Seoul and discuss ways for three-way cooperation and the agenda for the upcoming trilateral foreign ministers meeting this month. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Thursday, March 12th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Ojin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. We begin with news that Korea's central bank has cut its key interest rate to the unprecedented low level of 1.75% in an attempt to revitalize the economy. The move, the move, however, has further prompted concerns about the impact it could have on household debt, which continues to swell due to low mortgage rates and ease lending requirements. Hwang Jie reports. The Bank of Korea has decided to trim its key interest rate by 25 basis points to 1.75 percent in March after holding it steady for four straight months. The rate cut that came on Thursday marks the third in less than a year and leaves the key rate at a historic low. The central bank cut the rate two times in the second half of last year, each by a quarter of a percentage point as it joined government efforts to prop up the ailing economy. The central bank's move this month comes amid a wave of global monetary easing that countries like China, Japan and India are engaged in, along with weak economic sentiment at home despite aggressive government stimulus measures. Low inflation that would have actually dropped last month if it were not for a tobacco price hike also left room for more monetary easing. But the lowered key rate will stoke concerns about the country's snowballing household debt, which already exceeds 950 billion U.S. dollars. The government's deregulation drive in the housing sector and the two rate cuts last year worked in tandem to boost housing loans. Korea might also face a massive capital outflow with a historically low key rate due to a possible rate hike by the U.S. Federal Reserve in the coming months. The record low key rate also raises concerns over the central bank's independence, as some say recent remarks made by the country's finance minister may have pressured the BOK to cut the key rate. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Early in the year, foreign institutions had higher projections for Korea's economic growth than the nation's central bank. But now they have slashed their figures to the same level or even lower, and they've also cut their inflation outlooks on weaker domestic consumption and low oil prices. Sun jung in has the details. Foreign investment banks were prompt to adjust to Korea's growth forecast on mounting downward pressure. According to Bloomberg, the market median for Korea's growth forecast stood at 3.4 percent on Thursday, in line with the Bank of Korea's forecast. Bloomberg's survey of 27 institutions showed Nomura has slashed its outlook for Korea's growth to 2.5 percent from its earlier forecast of 3 percent, becoming the first foreign institution to project an expansion in the 2 percent range. Analysts cited slumping domestic consumption and slowing exports as factors denting the growth rate, along with the global economy recovering at a slower pace than anticipated. They say external factors such as the prospect of the U.S. raising its interest rate and the weakening of the Japanese yen could also drag Korea's growth down further. But other investment banks have kept their rosy outlooks, with Barclays projecting a growth rate of 4 percent and Credit Suisse matching the government's outlook of 3.8 percent. Foreign investment banks' projections for inflation also dropped to 1.3 percent from an earlier figure of 1.7 percent, as Seoul is under stronger deflationary pressure this year. 
Domestic research institutes have also indicated that they could lower the inflation outlook in their quarterly projections next month, with oil prices at a lower level than they projected last year. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. The Korean won has been rapidly depreciating against the U.S. dollar this month on expectations that the Bank of Korea was going to cut its rate in an attempt to boost the sluggish economy. In fact, the Korean currency depreciated faster than any other Asian currency in the month of March. In the eight trading days up to Wednesday, the won rose nearly 2.5% against the U.S. dollar to almost 1,131. Over the same period, the Japanese yen and the Malaysian currency rose at about 2 percent, the Singapore dollar just over 1 and percent, while other Asian currencies rose less than 1 percent. The Seoul-based Daishin Economic Research Institute expects the one to further weaken against the dollar and reach 1,151 within the next two months. This on expectations the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise rates in the coming months. President Park Geun-hye is scheduled to hold a three-way meeting with the leaders of Korea's ruling and opposition parties next Tuesday. The president is expected to talk about achievements from her recent Middle East trip and seek both parties' cooperation in her efforts to revitalize the economy and carry out social reforms. Now, just before departing for the Middle East, President Park said she would meet with the two leaders upon her return. This will be the first time for the president to sit down with the leaders of both parties since her presidential election rival Moon Jae-in was elected the opposition party leader last month. President Park also plans to explain her Middle East trip to the five heads of Korea's constitutional institutions on this Friday. They are the parliamentary speaker, the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice, the Prime Minister, the Constitutional Court President and the National Election Commission Chairperson. Senior diplomats from South Korea, China and Japan met in Seoul on Wednesday to lay the groundwork for a trilateral foreign ministers meeting that will be held in the Korean capital next weekend. Our Hwang Sang-hee reports. Tangled in historical and territorial disputes, senior officials from Korea, China and Japan met in Seoul on Wednesday in an effort to revive cooperation. Their second meeting in six months has added importance since it comes ahead of the first trilateral foreign minister's meeting since 2012. We have come to agree to host the foreign minister's meeting this month and convened here under the clear purpose of preparing for the meeting. Korea, as the current rotating chair, has been pushing for a gathering of the top diplomats since late last year. The three-way talks had been stalled mainly due to the territorial row between Japan and China over the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, known in China as Diaoyu. Despite the challenges, Japanese Deputy Foreign Minister Shinsuke Sugiyama expressed hope for the ministerial meeting to lead to a summit. In a better position to prepare for uh, the upcoming uh, uh, foreign ministerial trilateral uh, to be held sometime uh, uh, latter uh, half of uh, this month, uh, and hopefully to be uh, followed up further uh, by the highest level uh, uh, of us three. Taking a more cautious stance, the Chinese chief delegate refrained from mentioning such possibility, but acknowledged the importance of the upcoming meeting. And this progress has not come easily and should be cherished. But there is little hope that the ministerial meeting will actually break the ice between the three neighbors. An official at Seoul's foreign ministry said the top diplomats will strictly be discussing their trilateral cooperation, leaving out the more sensitive historical and territorial issues. Hwang sang Arirang News. Yeah, there's a good chance Ashton Carter, who recently took office as the new U.S. Defense Secretary and Secretary of State John Kerry, will pay a visit to Seoul next month. This is part of their separate trips to Northeast Asia. Our Lee ji tells us more. Two top U.S. officials are likely to fly out to Seoul next month. This is according to Korea-based Yonhap News Agency on Wednesday, citing diplomatic sources in Washington. U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter and Secretary of State John Kerry are reportedly planning separate trips to Northeast Asia in April, including stops in South Korea and Japan.
Their visits come ahead of President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's planned trips to Washington this year. As to what Carter is planning to do while he's here, the report says he's likely to talk about stepping up cooperation between Seoul and Washington to deter North Korean nuclear threats. The focus is also on whether or not he will talk about the issue of deploying an advanced U.S. missile defense system called THAAD to South Korea. Supporters claim deploying the system would better protect the country against North Korea's ballistic missiles, while opponents say it would only worsen relations with China and Russia. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is also expected to make a stop in Seoul sometime next month. Yanap sources say that while he's here, Kerry's likely to address any remaining issues surrounding last week's attack on U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert by an anti-U.S. activist. Kerry may also discuss ways to strengthen ties between Seoul and Washington in the wake of the attack on the U.S. ambassador. Lee Jun, Arirang News. The United States and China held their first Asia-Pacific security dialogue in Washington on Tuesday. According to the U.S. Defense Department, David Scheer, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, met with Guan Yufei, Director of the Chinese Defense Ministry's Foreign Affairs Office, to discuss pending security issues in the region. However, a detailed agenda was not revealed. There is speculation the officials touched upon North Korea issues as a core part of East Asia security. The unprecedented meeting was agreed upon between the two sides during then-Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel's visit to Beijing in April. The BBC is reportedly reviewing plans to provide a radio news service for people in North Korea. Citing a spokesperson from the BBC, the British newspaper The Telegraph reports that the public service broadcaster is examining ways to set up a special news channel in Pyongyang. This would be a big deal as ordinary North Koreans are strictly restricted in terms of their access to outside media and the Internet. The report, however, added the plan was just at an early stage and it could take years before any service was up and running. It said the broadcast, if launched, would probably be aired in Korean rather than in English, relying mostly on short ra shortwave radio. The nominee to be South Korea's next unification minister says he believes there will be more opportunities to improve inter-Korean relations since the uh, once rather the ongoing joint South Korea-US military drills wrap up in April. During his confirmation hearing on Wednesday, Hong Yong Ko said he plans to push for dialogue with North Korea to address pending issues and improve relations. He added that sending a special envoy to Pyongyang could be one of several options to making that happen. However, when asked about the possibility of lifting the so-called May 24 sanctions on the North, the nominee said that could only happen if Pyongyang assumed responsibility for the deadly torpedo attack on a South Korean warship in 2010. These sanctions cut off virtually all inter-Korean trade and exchanges, except for those involved in the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex. Several countries have requested the Korean police boost protection for their diplomatic delegations following last week's appalling knife attack on the U.S. ambassador to Korea, Mark Lippert. Korea's police chief made the announcement at a government ruling party meeting on Wednesday and added that extra protection will be provided. Security guards will be deployed even without prior request if circumstances are deemed dangerous. The police chief added that officers are now providing around-the-clock security to uh, Mr. Lippert and his wife, and security guards have also been sent to protect the Japanese ambassador. Korea is making moves to expand the nation's food export items to the global halal market following President Park and Hay's recent visit to the Middle East. To help local food firms comply with Muslim dietary laws, Korea has set up a new R&D agency devoted to the task. Our Park ji reports. The world's Muslim faithfuls follow certain food restrictions. For example, they don't consume pork of any form, alcohol and animals that are not properly slaughtered under Islamic law. Permissible food is labeled halal as halal means allowed in Arabic. 
and in an effort to expand the nation's food export items to the global halal market, a new halal food agency began operations on Thursday under the Korea Food Research Institute. The agency will focus on analyzing halal food standards in diverse Muslim countries like the United Arab Emirates and Indonesia and provide the nation's food manufacturers with guidelines on how to produce and develop halal certified foods. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs says the establishment of the Halal Food Agency is a follow-up measure of a recent MOU between Korea and the United Arab Emirates to promote cooperation in halal foods. The Agriculture Ministry hopes the MOU and the newly launched Halal Food Agency could help domestic food exporters make easier inroads into the global food market by targeting some 1.8 billion Muslims. The worldwide halal food market is estimated to be around 20 percent of the global food market. And since the late 2000s, many domestic food manufacturers like Nongshim and Pulmuwan have exported some of its food items, such as instant noodles and snacks that earned halal certifications. Korea aims to double the nation's halal foods exports from some 680 million U.S. dollars last year to over 1.2 billion dollars by 2017. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the global headlines we're following this Thursday lunchtime. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the news center. Eunice, Iraqi forces are continuing their offensive in the city of Tikrit, making crucial gains as they push through to uh, the city center. Yeah, that's right, Mark. They've already retaken significant parts of the mostly Sunni city, and if successful, it would mark a first and psychologically important victory in the struggle to push back Islamic State militants in Iraq. Our Kim Min Ji reports. Iraqi security forces and militias pushed toward major landmarks in the city of Tikrit on Wednesday in their biggest offensive so far against the group that calls itself Islamic State. Joint Iraqi forces raised a national flag above a military hospital, one of the latest installations retaken from the militants. Soldiers took out snipers perched on top of structures rigged with explosives, but sources say street-to-street -street fighting wasn't as intense as anticipated. Officials say government troops and Shia militias now hold two-thirds of the city. To create the hometown of former dictator Saddam Hussein was seized by Islamic State militants last June in a lightning advance. The military offensive that began early this month includes a combined force of up to 30,000 troops. If Iraqi forces regain full control of the city, it would give them momentum to retake the Islamic State-held city of Mosul, which is ten times bigger than Tikrit. In an apparent retaliation, Islamic State militants launched a fierce assault in the western Iraqi city of Ramadi. It involved more than a dozen suicide car bomb attacks. Kim Minzi, Arirang News. And over to Russia now, a member of Moscow's Human Rights Council says one of the suspects charged for the murder of opposition politician Boris Nemtsov may have been tortured into a confession. Following a prison visit, Andrei Babushkin reported he'd spotted numerous wounds on the body of Zaur Dadaev, who had confessed to being involved in the Moscow shooting. The former decorated Chechen police officer told the rights official he was stopped and left hooded until his court appearance in Moscow on Sunday. Babushkin urged an outside inspection of the ongoing investigation. Russia's powerful investigative body immediately pushed back, accusing the official of meddling and threatened to investigate. Now, if you had some problems downloading media from your iTunes account or Apple's App Store earlier, you certainly were not alone. Apple says all services are now back online after some 12 hours of shutdowns that locked consumers out and blocked mobile app developers from making money. The outage also affected access to iCloud and the company's ebook store, iBooks. Apple attributed the unusually extensive outage 
damage to an internal DNS or domain name system error. The interruptions came two days after the company announced plans to release its Apple Watch due to go on sale later next month. And in other news, China is the world's largest producer and consumer of tobacco, and its capital city is coming down hard on smokers with an extensive ban set to go into effect in June. Smoking will be banned in all indoor public spaces in Beijing, and new regulations will restrict advertising and sales as well. Shin Semin tells us more. Smokers in Beijing will no longer be able to light up in public as lawmakers seek to set a strong standard for all Chinese cities starting with the capital. Starting in June, all indoor public spaces in Beijing, including restaurants, offices and public transportation, will be smoke-free. Smoking is already banned in public outdoor spaces such as those near hospitals and schools. Stronger warning signs on tobacco products will also be required, along with tougher regulations on tobacco advertising in newspapers, magazines and posters on public transportation. Regulations on selling tobacco will also be tightened. Cigarettes will not be sold within a 100-meter radius of a school district. Smokers caught breaking the rule will be fined roughly 30 U.S. dollars for a single violation, up from the current fine of a $1.60. Those selling cigarettes to minors will be hit with a fine of over $30,000. The drive comes as the country's smoking problem has worsened, with the World Health Organization saying that more than one million Chinese citizens die of tobacco-related illness every year. Roughly 80 percent of Chinese men ages 15 or older smoke, exposing some 760 million people to secondhand smoke. But there are rising concerns about the effectiveness of the ban. Many such bans in China have been ignored in the past, and Beijing will be just one of 14 cities that will restrict smoking in indoor public spaces. Xin Zemin, Arirang News. Staying with a health-related topic, it's World Glaucoma Week, and in line with that, we have a special report on this disturbing condition. Now what's scary about it is that a lot of people don't even realize they have it when they do have it. This is because there are typically no early symptoms. Our Wan Jihan reports. Most people don't see it coming. Glaucoma is a potentially blinding disease that's often called the silent thief of sight because it can strike without warning. Glaucoma occurs when the fluid pressure inside the eye builds up over time and damages the optic nerves. This can first lead to a loss of peripheral vision, but if left untreated, it can eventually result in permanent blindness. What's even more concerning is that the disorder, once thought to be prevalent mostly among the elderly, is now becoming a problem for young people as well. The latest data from Health Ministry-designated eye hospital Nune Eye Hospital shows that the number of Koreans with glaucoma in their 20s and 30s has more than doubled over the last five years. Doctors say that although there is no cure for glaucoma, early detection and treatment can help slow down its progress. Dr. Song Young Lim of Asan Medical Center says that no matter their age, people should have their eyes checked regularly. People who are experiencing farsightedness because of aging or people with a family history of glaucoma, diabetes or high blood pressure should go get a more thorough screening. The World Health Organization says glaucoma is the world's second leading cause of blindness and that an estimated 60 million people have been affected by it. Won ji Arirang News. Well, the dry weather continues to dominate. We dry weather advisories in place across the many of the country, including here in the capital. So drink lots of water to stay hydrated. And remember, eight glasses of water a day is recommended. And don't forget to apply a good amount of moisturizer to protect your skin. And unlike the freezing morning we had, temperatures are going up rapidly. So big temperature gaps of nearly 10 degrees are expected across 
across the much of the country. So take good care of your health and dress accordingly. And with that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The daytime high here in the capital will rise to 7, while Taegu and Gwangju will peak at 13, and Busan will rise to 12 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island and Taejeon should see a high of 12 and 11, and Tukdo tops out at 4. Now, temperatures are on the rise, and we'll have a big jump in temperatures next week. So hang in there for a couple more days. The spring is really right around the corner. But that's all for Korea. And here's the international weather for beers around the world. Well, those are the stories we're following on this Thursday afternoon here in Seoul. Join Mark and I at the same time on Friday. Have a great day.